Grammy Award-winning producer, keyboardist, composer, arranger and synthesist Jason Miles is the special guest on episode 14, season 2 of Music Matters with Daryl Craig Harris. Hey Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing really good. Great. So, so um, you know, where, where are you joining us from? I'm joining you from uh, Orange County, New York, 50 miles north of uh, New York City in the Hudson Valley. Oh, it's beautiful up there. Gorgeous. Yeah, yes. So you're originally, um, you're originally from Brooklyn way back when, right? Way back when. Yes. I mean, you know, I keep on saying this, you know, that I, I, I can never forget being in school and, and looking and seeing, you know, I, I had this almanac and I looked and I, and, and I was there and I said, wow. In the year 2000, I'm going to be like 49 years old. Oh I did exactly God. the same thing. <laughs> you know, I said, so I said, oh, my God, you know, now here we are 2021. Right. And, you know, life has come to look at me and I've looked at life in a whole other way now because, you know, uh, um, I look back at, at everything and I say, man, I am just fortunate and lucky and you know, it didn't come by luck. It, but things you you always have to have a little luck, you know. Yeah. But I, but I mean, everything that I have is a culmination of like where I came from, I believe, because you know, growing up in Brooklyn, but back then in the '60s and everything, I saw some incredible music, man. Yeah, I, bet. I mean, oh my god, I mean, it, it was hybrid. You know, anybody? I was a hybrid. I loved jazz. I loved rock. You know what I mean? Like, I loved Motown also. Yeah. You know, and uh, and, and I got into all of them. You know, I'd go to the Fillmore East and my, I, then I go to a jazz club. Then I studied jazz with a great teacher. Then, you know, uh, uh, then I, of course, listen to the radio and, yeah. you know, go into all the clubs in the city and then playing in bands. I mean, it was a very heady time. You know, I spent summers in the Borscht Belt in, in uh, you know, the hotels, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Getting initiated in life. I mean, so, there's I mean, so many, you know, so, so many great players from that area too, right? It's like a, it's amazing oh, yeah. how many guys came out of that, out of that, that, that kind of stew of creativity and music. Oh, but well, where, where, where my neighborhood was in Brooklyn, you can't even believe how many amazing people came out of it. You know, from from Bernie Sanders to Chuck Schumer, Barbara Streisand, you know, uh, uh, Neil Neil Sedaka, Neil Diamond. I know, you it's know. Crazy. Uh, you know, all these all these people are, up, are from Brooklyn, but then you get some great set, mu jazz musicians, Dave Liebman and Steve Grossman and Bob Berg and, you know, some really amazing people that just came up, you know, back then. It, I, it was it, it was just, I, I don't know, very, very heady, although you didn't realize it at the time because all I wanted to do was get the hell out of high school, you know? <laughs> yeah, you're just trying to try to get to the next step, right? And exactly. When, when, did you, when did you first um, get interested in music and start playing? Well, like seven years old. Wow. Awesome. You know, did, I played accordion. And you did you take uh, lessons from the beginning? Yes, or you just, yes, yes, yes. Took lessons from the very beginning, and uh, you know, then I stopped because I, I was like really turned off. You know, trying to do academia and everything. You know, and then so my education came when I was in college. My girlfriend, who's now my wife, uh, she, we used to live in a trailer, and right down the road was the Columbia Record Clubs. So oh, she yeah. got out of school. She got out of school a year earlier than me. So she went to work at the Columbia Record Club, which was a huge warehouse, humongous warehouse. I think I was. Like I stole all the money. <laughs> like well, yeah, like a, like like an airplane hangar. It was, you know what I mean. And um, and what happened was that every month, the beginning of the month, they'd have an employee sale where they'd get rid of all the excess that they had there and everything. Wow. And so I would. So I so so she was able to get a pass. So I went there like eight o'clock in the morning, waited online, had a twenty dollar bill with me. The albums were a dollar a piece. Crazy. And I'd come back with like my, my I would come back with my months worth of listening. Some months I came back with more. But I mean, hell, I, I got bitches brew there. Yeah. And I got, you know, all these great albums because because I'm in Indiana. Everybody was looking for country music and some people looking for rock, you know. <laughs> so the jazz yeah. section and the classical section, everything was always empty. I could pick up whatever I, I bought. I, I have like 75 CTI records, you know, from back then, you know? Funny. Yeah. yeah I mean, but, that, that, uh, that's, that, that was a great, actually, that, that it's funny because people make fun of that CBS record club, but a lot of people got, I've got, were able to listen to music that they would not have oh, normally, absolutely. Not normally had, right? Yeah, to, to, totally. Correct. I, I don't know if you know, you, you know, you know who the Cohen brothers are? Yeah, yeah. 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 The Cohen brothers made this movie called a serious man. Hmm. And, uh, it's a wonderful movie. It's about these Jewish people that are living in Minnesota and everything. And, you know, the kids are like, you know, just real like, you know, he's like a, a 
Well, he's like just like a you know like a, a, a junior high school kid getting ready to be bar mitzvah. It was a real freaking pain in the ass, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so what he so what he does is he ends up ordering stuff from the Columbia Record Club without telling his parents. <laughs> I did the same thing. <laughs> and 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 one day the guy calls up, you know, the, the guy the guy's trying to get a hold of uh, the father, you know, he goes, you know, Hi, who's you know, and he's a professor in college, so they're calling him in college. Hi, this is Dick Dutton from Columbia Record Club. Yes. Did you order Santana Abraxas last month? You know, funny. And it was a whole scene. It was. It was. It was. It was really, really, really. Sir, is that bitch's brew album yours? <laughs> actually, yes, exactly. Eight, probably maybe an eight track. I, I had eight tracks. Funny. Me uh, too. I had eight tracks also. I had all that shit, man. You know. Yeah. I mean, really. If, if you had eight tracks now that worked, it'd be worth a lot of money. Right. I don't know yeah. why. I don't know why because they were like the. The ultimate doom and gloom, uh, you know, product to use. You know, it's so funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, where where did you go to school at college? I because you went to university. I, I went to school at Indiana State University. Awesome. I was going to I was going to go to music school, and uh, there were some things that were totally messed up in my world with my family and my grandmother died. My father had a heart attack. Blah blah blah. But the, yeah. the, 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 and, and 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 I was supposed to stay in New York and everything like that. You know, and I, I went to Indiana. I got in there right at the end of the semester because I couldn't get into music school, you know? So what happened was that I I was in Terre Haute, Indiana, and uh, I met, you know, a lot of people there. And I, I, that was my education in music because I'd sit in my, my, my trailer when we weren't in, uh, you know, doing stuff or going to school and I'd listen Mm -hmm. to albums all day and the albums all had album credits. You know what I mean? So when I came back to new, when I came back to New York and I met these musicians, I knew what they had done already. And that really impressed me. Yeah, that really impressed people because, yeah. you know, I, I'd go up to like, uh, um, uh, you know, my first night in New York, uh, my second night in New York, my cousin's boyfriend played one of the famous New York studio musicians. His name was Don Grolnick. Yeah. And so I went and I saw them play at this club called McKell's on the Upper West Side. And I met like Will Lee and David Sanborn, right. who I had seen play with Paul Butterfield for years, you know. And then I saw, you know, Will Lee and, and uh, Chris Parker, Joe Beck and on you know and so i go up oh you know oh man i can't believe i'm meeting you thank you i love the way you played on so and so really oh my god i love that you know yeah. they were like wow this, this guy's really you know knows knows his stuff you know yeah, educated and, about the, the players well, and, yeah. and 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 then when i was there about three weeks later we went and we saw a weather report at this club in new jersey that was in the middle of nowhere and there was no gas and we managed to get some gas and go down there and it was really really a crazy night the place was packed but we didn't realize it was packed because it was a pickup place. And once weather report came on, everybody <laughs> left. That's everybody funny. left. And and that night I got to meet Joe Zavinal. Awesome. And we, we became friends for 30 years wow. after that. You know, and I had to prove myself to him because I was nobody when he met me. But he liked where I was coming from as far as my knowledge of synthesizers and keyboards. Yeah. But back then, not everybody could talk about this stuff. You know. Yeah, what and I mean? that, that's actually a big part of your background is programming and synthesizers. Yes, and, yes. You know. Yes, of course. But see, that's the whole thing that's so interesting now. You know, people look at me, it's like, you know, well, you know, yes, you're a producer and everything. Let me ask something. Do you know about the 15 years that I spent in the studios in New York and L.A. and making records from like 1979 to 1994? I didn't stop working. I just I just went out on my own. You know, yeah. and, and that was a magic, and, you know, really magic time. A lot, a lot of great oh, stuff going on. Yeah. Oh, well, what was magic was the technology was making it magic right. because it was so fresh and new. We were always being thrown some curveball by some company releasing something that, oh, I had to get this and I had to get this. And, but it <laughs> enhanced the music. I right. think what made a big difference, what, what made a big difference what, was that I didn't use all the generic stuff that everybody else used. I had like a mm. PPG Wave 2.3 and, right. and I, had, I had an Emulator 2 and I had a Matrix 12 by Oberheim. And, yeah. uh, you, you know, and, and then I had other stuff also. And um, I mean, the thing know, is, I, too, I, I, like when you talk about people t- like Michael Jackson or Whitney Houston, all those folks mm-hmm. like those those guys, those producers, they want or even if you're producing, but you want the most current up to date oh. sound. And it's not cheap uh, to do that either. It's, it's oh, like expensive. Back, back then or back then it wasn't. But, yeah. you know, I mean, when I really started getting into the flow, these people were paying me very well. Right. Very well. And so, you know, I kept my vibe up and everything because, number one, it was important to me also. Because I wanted the instruments. I wanted to get right. the most out of them as well. Even though I'm working with people, I'm also writing on the side and I'm doing stuff. But I was yeah. always so busy 
because different producers would like want me for this and want me for that then they want me for this and I would go there and then I would be you know mm -hmm. so I mean doing my own my own music was kind of hard to um, how, how you did know, you really because um, um, at that point well it's even still this the studio scene is so competitive how did you first really break in was that your connection with Joe or just meeting the no, players or no 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 what happened was that I you know we used to go to see a lot of different music mm -hmm. you know and uh and, and, this, and when I met Joe, I met the percussionist at Weather Report, and we started hanging, mm -hmm. and, and he started introducing me to people, and I was really into, the, like, the whole thing. I learned a lot about Brazilian music because he was right. Brazilian, and I met all these different musicians, you know, all over the place, and, you know, I wasn't into, like, playing bebop and everything, and everybody was, like, really criticizing me. Oh, you're not playing the changes, man, <laughs> and all this other stuff. Yeah. But, 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 but what happened was, you know, uh, one of the things that happened was that there was a great keyboard player named Kenny Kirkland, and he was yeah. an amazing piano player. And and I knew Kenny, you know, I met him like early on. And so, you know, we would always be joking around and I met him and he was a monster and he was playing with Michael Urbaniak and different people. Yeah. And so and so one day after uh, this was in 19, I think, 79 or 80, it was, um, you know, he was doing a record date for this Japanese vibe and he wanted to know if I would bring synthesizers to the studio because that's what they wanted, but he wasn't, uh, he didn't know how to program them. Yeah, because so most, the, the, most of the jazz bebop guys, they weren't, they were no, really straight no, up piano no, players, right? No, exactly, exactly. But, but Kenny had another thing. He knew how to be contemporary as well, just like Chick mm -hmm. Corea. Kenny yeah. knew how to go and get into the mini move and get into that whole thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so what happened was that uh, I went and did the date and it went great, you know what I mean? But well, because Kenny was like playing this brilliant shit and I was programming these great sounds on the profit, you know? Yeah. And, and it was sounding great. And Kenny goes, man, we got to do this and again and everything. Instead of realizing, you know, awesome. well, you know, if I'm just cool and not like telling people, well, I got to play, I got to do this. I'll go up there and I'll program for them. Right. You know, because because you're, still that's work, you're, you're working and you're learning, and you're meeting people. Yeah. It's all it's well, all please. good. Right. Oh, yeah. That, yeah that, that's what was that was needed for me. And so yeah. what basically happened was that was that a great saxophone player, um, one of the best in the world, Michael Brecker. Right. He 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 was a friend of mine. And he and we after he got out of rehab and everything in the early 80s, we rehooked up again. And by then, MIDI was happening and everything. And he really wanted to get into it. So I bumped into him one night at a sushi bar in New York with Kathy. It was empty and we hadn't seen him in a while. And all of a sudden, you know, he was at a place where he couldn't hang out in the same crowd anymore. Right. You know, yeah. he had to go in and, and and then he was totally into the music and he knew that I was doing it. So we were hanging out a lot, you know, awesome. with, with Mike and I go and we would, you know, and he play on some stuff for me and everything. And he also gave me a, a, a super big lesson because the first project that I had, I, I asked him to play on and I, I didn't have a good chart for him. And he really called me out, man, <laughs> really called me out. It was embarrassing, but he wanted to embarrass me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I went back and I learned all about, you know, the charts you need to write for the New York cats and how to right. do this and how to do that. And when I came back, he goes, man, you can make it, man. Cause you're listening, you're listening, you know? Yeah. And so, and, and so what happened was that Mike was telling different people about me you know and certain people started calling me like hey we want to get you in the studio and everything this is like this is the mid 80s right and so what happened was that and i've been doing dates but i hadn't been doing like the super a level you know yeah because there's like, multiple levels at that yes yeah, yeah, so much exactly. competition right exactly exactly so what happened was that uh you know i'm at this club one day and uh he's everybody was going to europe in a couple of days to do stuff festivals Right. And they invited me down. So Mike invited me. So I'm hanging. And the next thing I'm sitting at a table and this great drummer walks over to me, Lenny White right. from Return yeah. to Forever. And I had seen Mike talk to him before that. So anyway, Lenny came over to me and said to me, hey, uh, you know, man, I said, oh, Lenny White, man. And he goes to me, who's your favorite producer? And I'm going, oh, that's a snap, Trevor Horn. And he yeah. goes, oh, we are definitely going to work together because he was <laughs> totally cool. he was totally awesome. into art of noise. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was yeah. into art of noise. I was very early on and like, you know, in like the whole sampling thing, I realized the beauty of a Malcolm McLaren and Buffalo Girls and scratching right. and everything. Even though I was listening to all these other kind of things, I was still very hybrid. I right. could go home and put on Everybody Digs Bill Evans. And at the same point, we can go home and listen to Nubian Sundance by Weather Report. Or <laughs> right. Brew. Yeah. And I could also put on Hendrix or something like that because we, we loved all of this stuff, you know. Right. So so then one day, all of a sudden, you know, about six months later, Lenny calls me and says, hey, man, you heard from Marcus? And I go, no, because I had to use Marcus on my very first album. It's a long, oh. long story about that. So anyway, right. what happened was that, you know, I said, no. And he goes, well, we're doing something tomorrow, man. You know, you should hear from him. Call him. But I couldn't get a hold of him for like four hours because his phone was busy and there's no call waiting in 19. Yeah, there's no, there's no page or cell phones. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. No pages, no cell phones, no, hardly even any answering machines. You know? Right, yeah. So, so what happened? 
So what happened was that the next morning, Marcus called me like really early. Hey, man, you come to the studio and bring some synthesizers, man. We're doing this thing. I go, yeah, I will. So I brought the coolest shit with me. I brought the wave and the wave term and, right. and all this other stuff. And so we started working on it and everything. And from that day in 1985, mm-hmm. for 10 years, Marcus and I were like a team. Yeah. He's you a great, know, you know, I, I, I love Marcus because he's, he's a, like a really cool dude. Like, obviously he's, he's very well known, but what I like about him is that he's very down to earth. He's, he's a good guy. Like he's just a good guy, great player, obviously. And in that time period, he was so connected as you were with all those guys, all the A-list guys right in New York. Oh yeah. But, that, but, that, but that's stuff. what I did, yeah. you know, because, you know, uh, because I said, well, you know, I can send you some of the stuff I, I'm doing. And I was, and so it says, Hey man, you, you're working with Marcus, man. You gotta be good. You know? <laughs> And, and yeah. we were like, we, we were like ninjas, man. We were lethal, Marcus and I. We would go into the room and man, you know, he'd have the song together and we go and we start building up the song and everything like mm-hmm. that. And people would look at us going, man, you guys are too much, man. You know, that's why Roberta <laughs> loved us. Roberta Flack loved us. Luther, I did eight albums with Luther, right. you know. Miles, of course, you know, he introduced me to Miles, you know. Yeah, your, and, your, uh, dis- your discography, like, you know, um, I was talking to our mutual friend, Nigel, from, from uh, Jazz in Europe, uh-huh. and he's like, man, you got to talk to Jason. And I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm cool, yeah, let me check out the discography. And I'm like looking at this going, wow, that's everything I love. All that music, <laughs> you know, yeah. the Luther well, stuff, Grover Washington Jr., yeah. Whitney, Michael Jackson. I mean, like, it's the list is, is so crazy. But, but, but at the same point, you know, that's not what the path I wanted to take. Yeah. You know, well, life, had, life has that. a way of, of choosing for you. <laughs> well, that's, but, yeah, but the whole thing is at that point that that was happening, I was starting to get some production things going on. Okay. And so what happened was that I said, you know, man, I could go and I could take two roads. I can go this road and say no, or I can go that road and take that ride. Right. And I decided I'm going to take that ride, man, because I'm going to meet a lot of people. If everything goes OK, and I just keep the level of my work up. And yep. then, you know, when we did the miles, that we did some stuff that was going really well. And we did David Sanborn and that was cool. And we did his album, Jamaica Boys and some other stuff. But then when we did miles, the whole paradigm changed. You know, and miles, because, is, it's interesting, too, not to cut you off, but like it's interesting with ahead, miles, M- miles and Chick Corea, because, you know, I've interviewed a lot of guys that um, that we both maturely know. Um, and the, that that connection between miles and Chick Corea, how many amazing players came through those bands like. Oh. It's just a, it's, it's such a long list. It's crazy, right? Oh, well, Miles was a genius. But the whole thing yeah. is, you know, how did how did how did Miles learn about all these people? Other people told him. Right. You know what I mean? That's what the whole thing you don't realize. You can send something out to somebody, press kit, CDs, all of this stuff, man. But until you start getting word of mouth, yeah, it's really hard because somebody wants to know who used you first. What did you do before this? You know, like when I met Miles, you know. He was just like looking, but then he started seeing it. He had no idea how I did what he did, what what I did. All all he knew was that what was happening on those on that tape was magic. Right. And you know, and we were we were we were creating that. I mean, you know, and there were no rules when we were doing tutu. There were no rules. Yeah, and it's really. funny because on the Miles record, you could hear him directing the band. <laughs> some you of know? the tracks. Oh, oh I, I, on on especially on Bitches Brew, especially right. if you listen yeah. to an MP3 because it comes through much more in an MP3 with exactly, the compression. Yeah. yeah. But you know. But Miles was always like, you know, he never said anything because he didn't understand, you know, how to do hey, what happened. And so Marcus would say, you know, well, I'm here with Jason, man. What would you do? You, hey, do you have anything that you kind of like hearing that you want to do? Well, I want something in that part and everything. Really? What are you hearing? Something that nobody's ever heard before. <laughs> You're like, oh. So, so Mark, Marcus says to me, Miles wants to hear something that nobody's ever heard before. I'm going, oh, well, that's great, you know. But we came up with <laughs> yeah, stuff, man, because that was like a sampling craze, man. I was sampling all the stuff. I was sampling yeah. orchestra hits, stuff from TV, stuff right. from movie soundtrack, little orchestra things here and there. Yeah, that was, that was, cars. it was kind of like the wild, wild west with the sampling oh, thing yeah. too, right? Yeah. It, it, oh, it was. Well, you know. Uh, you know, I, I I had I had that, in, and then when I got a better sampler, and Luther found out that I could fly in background vocals, he was like, "Whoa!" But there was a lot of voodoo involved. We had a sync to MIDI, right. to MIDI to Simpty. You know what I mean? But <laughs> but we were in the state of the art studios back then. Those yeah. records, but no matter what the story is, once like the 1980, say four came 83. You know, those records started sounding great. Yeah. I mean, really, you know, you know, the, the whole the whole thing of being in the studio and what the studio had to offer you back then was an incredibly skilled engineer right. who knew how to go and work an SSL or a knee board and knew how to go and you know create the different EQs together. Yeah. And then you had then you had these instruments, you know, that were really sounding great. And, you know, the, and, and all you needed was it was great songs. Yeah. And if you had that, 
you had the you had this and we had great songs we had great yeah. songwriters oh those yeah those i mean the people that are working with those folks are obviously like they are the best and when you have guys like quincy and producing michael oh, jackson yeah. and all that and the thing is that those records still sound good even i mean like you listen to miles that stuff it's just timeless right it's i mean a hundred years from now it's still going to be awesome i could tell you something i put on kind of blue and i think it yeah. sounds amazing you yeah. know it all depends on who was recording it for that time you right. know, and, and and you had guys like Rudy Van Gelder, you know, like and Stan Tonkel and uh, uh, oh, what's yeah, his the, name? All the legendary guys. Yeah. Yeah. You have Al Schmidt, yep. Phil Ramone, you know, uh, Don Palouse. I mean, all these really, really great guys. And they were on staff. Who's, who's some like of your, like, your, when you think of favorite artists, I mean, obviously Miles is one of them, but what, what are some of your other really like famous artists that immediately pop into your head that you've worked with? That I've worked with? Yeah. Um, well, Sting. Right, I was going to say Sting because that that's and that that actually won a Grammy, right? For that, that yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that was an that, that's my own, you know, that was that was one of my stories that you know that I'm writing about in my book and everything about making that album about how hard it really was to get that off the ground and how there was so much disbelief that I could pull it together. Yeah, you know, because that was kind of, a, that kind of a kind of a compilation record, right? Of, of, of yeah, with artists. That, yeah, that, yeah, that was the music of Yvonne Linz. That's what right. tied everybody together. But Miles Davis was going to do that album. Hmm. Uh, back in 1992 and he told me about it one night and uh, i was going to be on it with quincy producing it and then he died yeah so i so i spoke to yvonne and i told him about it and everything and i said you know man there's a record here and i want to try to make this record yvonne. yeah and he goes well go ahead and try you know finally eight years later it happened because everybody turned me down but i mean you know with shaka khan i loved working with shaka right she's like she was a lot of fun and when she was laser focused on those vocals she was yeah, i know focused, yeah you know? Yeah, it's she still same thing. Like you hear those early Chaka records, like with what she's oh, yeah. doing. I mean, it's just oh, like, yeah, yeah, so oh, yeah, man. She, yeah, I'm, I'm happy she sang on a couple of my things, you know. Uh, Grover, of course, I love Grover, he was a special cat. Michael Brecker, I mean, one of the greats, amazing yeah. guys of all time, you know. All the musicians in New York that I met were also unique, you know, Will Lee, Steve Gadd, you yeah. know, Randy Brecker, David Sanborn, you know. I love Roberta Flack, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, it's just so so classic, classic people and voices, and just, oh yeah, but I mean, you know, but they all wanted what I had. Right. They all wanted that synth vibe because that was happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the whole thing is, we weren't. It's like Luther said. You know what I like, Jason? I like that your stuff doesn't sound like a big accordion. <laughs> Yeah, and I said, at, that time, yeah, well, at that time, the synth thing was still weird. It's still yeah, like brand yeah, yeah. new, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you had cats that just kept on stacking MIDI synthesizers right, exactly. each other. Right. Where I said, you know, it's the character of the sound you're looking for, I said, that makes it so you can create it. When I did this album, Power of Love, there yeah. was like, you know, um, on, on the main tune, Power of Love, to get that keyboard sound was eight synthesizers to wow. create that pad, okay? Right. But everyone had its own layer to make it so the sound was working. Yeah, you're thinking, more in terms like, of, you're thinking in terms of a symphony, not just do right. it, jump, bump, right. you know, putting a bunch of keyboards on top right. of each other, right? Right, and so, and, and so you know, I, I was saying, well, where do you start? You know, we have to start with a, with a structure and a bass. And, you know, it, it was so easy to be able to fail doing MIDI keyboards, you know? But, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, oh, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, but I spent so much time knowing the instruments and knowing the stuff. Right. And I was always prepared because some of these albums were big and took a long time to make. And right. I'm the only person in there. And they don't want to hear the same thing twice. You know what I mean? They yeah. want to hear characters on each different songs. And so I have books of stuff. I have books downstairs with all my, my sounds that I layered for the albums and everything like, mm. like that, you know? I'm thinking maybe I need to do that on the internet and like do one of those FT, whatever they're called now. Yeah, FNTs you know what? Because or... actually, because a lot of people and people like those sounds come back, right? Like that that JX3P thing, like that organ from oh, that. Yeah. Like all the, they're, 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 and the DX7 when that first came out, like oh, that please. DX7, you know, Rhodes piano thing. I remember seeing Chicago back in the day and they had like eight DX7s on stage. Right. <laughs> to get that, right. to get that sound. But that's the sound that everybody wanted, that contemporary. Oh sound. my God, the DX7. Well, the whole thing is, here's the story. Now people realize that the DX7 actually kind of sounds like crap and that they should have stayed with the Fender Rhodes. And it's very Fender heavy. Wasn't, <laughs> the Fender was oh my God, well, that's, what, that, that's what swayed me away from the Fender Rhodes. It was like backbreaking. Right, but it has know? this classic but, sound, right? Right, but then I was able to get a cartage company because at the, because around 19, you know, as times went on, my studio rack was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. And I'd go to LA and I'd have like 17 road cases, wait to be at Rocket Cargo, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then we, we go, we go in the studio, set it all up get it all working together, you know, like, and I used to make it where all you had to do was take stereo out right into the board. 
Right. And we were fine. Yeah, know? but you're back in the, back in those days. I mean, now it's different because of laptops and computers. But back oh, in yeah. those days, you you had to have that gear. Like you were expected oh, to have it, right? Absolutely. Well, somebody like myself was because here's a story. There were guys that were keyboard players with synthesizers. You know, right. exactly. That's what they, that's yeah. what they were. I was a I was a real synthesis keyboard right. player. You know what I mean? I was a yeah. real synthesis. Yeah, guys like and Thomas, Thomas Dolby and those guys that were kind of in that same oh, thing. Oh, right? oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thomas Dolby was freaking great, man. You know, yeah. uh, you know, and, and then then there were the New York Cats and the L.A. Cats, Michael Boddicker right. and Larry Williams and Robbie Buchanan, and then we had Jeff Bova and Robbie Kilgore. You know, these these were guys that was that was serious synth guys too. Yeah. You know. And uh, so, so we had our we had our little crowd, and it wasn't like a lot of people because not everybody you know knew what was going on, you right. know. And and even if they had a big rack, that didn't mean that they knew how to program all their synthesizers. Or they could get everybody, it. Or they could get it together quickly. That's the other part of it, right? Well, well, everybody was always looking for sounds. You got any sounds you can sell me, man, or anything like that? No, I can figure <laughs> your, out your, your own floppy sound. disk. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But those were you know those were incredible times, and and, and the whole thing is is that the, the money was there. Yeah. There was lots of money in the music business back then. And, you know, people don't understand when I tell them that, that back then the music business was the ultimate trickle down economy. That, True. Yeah. That, that, that what happened? Well, it started with you getting signed to a label. OK. And then the label gives you money to make a record anywhere between, you know, 150 to a million dollars. Yeah. If you're Michael right, Jackson, you're getting like as much as you want. Right. Because <laughs> Well, Luther, I, Luther's album, Luther, yeah. million dollar album. We right. spend a million dollars, but even most of the albums were like two fifty to five hundred thousand dollars. You know, right. studio was an ex- studio was ex- expensive, and you know, and this is what happens. But they were selling tonnage, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, people, are, you, people you know, are paying for music now. That now, now they're not really used to doing it. Right. Anymore. Well, 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 right. They were paying. They were they were selling tonnage back then. I mean, in one week <laughs> in Colombia, man, they had like Celine Dion, Michael Jackson, and Mariah Carey selling like millions of albums. They were printing money. Where, but but let me tell you, the trickle down also happened at the labels, where right. the labels were all flush in cash. Okay, just just to say, you know, the first the first trickle down comes when the label comes and it trickles down to the band, to right. the musicians, management, studio, studio musicians. You know, because yep. there's a lot, lot of parts, a lot of parts and pieces that go into right. that. Right, Resta- yeah. restaurants. You know what right. I mean? All of yep. that stuff. You know, then then you had the other side, the publishing deal to to the tour support, to being on tour, to the venues, to the, you know, to the backline guys. It right. was all trickling down, man, from someplace. But that's because the label was the anchor for as screwed up as they were. They had the money and they were making the money, but you were getting what you wanted. You wanted your album. You wanted this. You wanted a career. Right. And, you know, back then, a lot of times they hung with you for a few albums before they, you know, decided that it wasn't going to work and everything. Yeah, and it was, they, they allowed the time for bands to develop, which sometimes it takes a couple albums. You hear that story all Absolutely the time. Does. Like there's a, there's a Fleetwood Mac or there's a, these bands where it took two or three albums before they actually really hit. And now that they, don't, they would never get that chance these days, right? Absolutely. So, you know, it's like the paradigm was like, was like totally, you know, totally different. Hmm. And so, you know, we were able to take advantage of, of that whole thing. And, uh, you know, it was complex to make these albums, believe it or not. I mean, it really was complex because... You know, you had to go and you had to make sure everything was getting get to get onto the tape in time and work with simply time code and understand how to program the sync box. And <laughs> right. Everything. Yeah. It was, you know, it, it, it was, you know, there was a lot. Of, and that's why somebody like Marcus was like, you know, Jason's doing that, man. I can not have to worry about that with him. You know, everything's right. always going to be under control, you know, because I basically was like I was basically like running the session. It was all based around everything that I had. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because, I mean, because so, I, if it, Especially the electronic music and doing the synthesis. Oh, yeah. That that was, I mean, all, like you talk about Luther, like in that in that time period, especially, like that was such a huge part of his sound, right? That layered synth sound. And... Well, guess what though? <laughs> that was because of me. Yeah. Because Luther had Luther had a record called "The Night I Fell in Love," and then he had "Bad Boy" and all these other ones, you know. And right. they were great, but they were built around like his band and yep. his stuff and 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 that whole thing. And then he 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 was saying, you know, that he took R and B, he hit a wall. You know what I mean? He's the number one artist in R and B. Yeah, but he wanted, he wanted to break break out of that. Yeah, just, absolutely. Right? Yeah. And so what happened was that I did when, when I did Tutu. You know, uh, one night uh, we were in the, uh, you know, uh, leaving the studio doing another project actually after Tutu, and my wife was with us, and Marcus came into the car and said, "You know, man, I want to turn Jason onto Luther because we're going to make a new album, and I think that he could be a real key to making awesome. this album because of being able to cross Luther over into pop." 
Right. I, do, I knew I knew how to get that those sounds. I know how to get that stuff happening. You know. And it's funny and so, because the, these days we all think of Luther as a pop artist and R and B, but actually back then he was an R and B artist, straight up. Absolutely, right? R, yeah. straight up R and B artist. You know. And uh, I came in and he was saying, you know, this is what I want, man. I want you to help us, you know, get get to. So I'm getting pop hits. And the first album, man, we had like this tune, Stop to Love. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. And it was like, we were listening to that in the studio in Montserrat, coming back with the, the big keyboards and everything like that. The room was shaking. And like a few hours later, the project warden came up to me and said to me, hey, Luther wants you to finish the whole album. So when you come awesome. back to New York, we got a whole bunch of dates. Right. And I worked with him for 10 years after that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so it's, I think it was eight albums total with Luther, right? You were saying. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I did yeah. eight albums with him. And the thing is, like, four, he, four. in that time period, he was hitting hard. Like, he had like oh, so, so many. Super years. hard. Yeah. We, we, that's, that's the whole thing I keep on saying. You know, I said, there's been different sections of Luther, but we were like a real family with Luther. There right. was the live guys who also were on the records, also the singers, especially. And great, great, and, everybody's great players. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then there was like, you know, the studio catch with me and Marcus and Ray Bardani and. Uh, even Paul Paul Brown at times, you know, and we'd all like kind of know each other and everything, but it was a magic time because Luther was going like this. He was ascending up right. and he was ascending up because we were, we were creating new vibes for him, man. And the, and the music and, his, and, and the whole thing is Marcus started co-producing with him. That mm -hmm. got Luther into more of a modern stage about what's happening, you know? Right. And it, and it would be so much fun. You know, there would be times during the record, like when we did here and now, um, you know, we were, we, it was funny, you know, we had done here and now in New York and, um, uh, we, you know, we are almost done. And Luther goes, we're going to finish the rest out in LA. And I was sitting there going to myself with the rest, man, we could finish this thing like tomorrow if we want. So <laughs> no, he wanted to go back to LA, you know? Yeah, I mean? yeah. So, okay. So all my shit gets sent out to LA. All right. <laughs> You're and, like, whatever. And, and how, now how I'm I get paid. So it's all good. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. I go where they tell me to go. Yeah. So now I'm in LA. Go, go I actually brought Kathy. It was my birthday. You know what I mean? My birthday. I brought mm -hmm. Kathy to come. But said, look, you're going to hang at the Sunset Marquee. I'm not going to be here, but enjoy yourself. You know, we're nice. making plenty of money. Right. You know? And so it, and and so what happened was that we went into the studio and I would say like the first day, the first day was on a Saturday. We're finishing up the orchestra and Luther goes, let's finish the song up. And we're going, OK. And like three hours later, we're done with here and now. Oh, and I'm wow. saying to myself, OK, so now I'm booked till a week from tomorrow <laughs> now <I'm> <laughs> do i have off this whole time and then yeah. luther goes you know i keep on forgetting to tell you guys marcus we need another song because this is my greatest hits album and i'm giving people two new songs along with the greatest hits here and uh, now and and whatever we can come up with so you gotta write me a song you know write, wow. write, write me a song right so i said okay here we go that's why we're here you know <laughs> so but but here but here's what he said that was really cool he said I want the kind of song, I want one of those really hip club tunes, ah, awesome. you know, where, you, where we can make the really cool sounds and a cool groove, cool beat, and I can do some, you know, you know R&B relics and all this stuff. I want mm. like the hippest stuff with the with the best sounds and everything, like the real state of the art. I'm like, yeah. wow, okay. That's and that awesome. was like incredibly fun because he gave up at the point. He knew we had a monster hit. Right. We had here and now. He's like, we, you guys he, just, he, you guys just do what you do. Yeah, yeah. Give me something. <laughs> all, all, all it was like, give me something great. And the song that right. we came up with, I love this song. It's called Treat You Right. Mm -hmm. And I love it, man. It was a lot of fun. And he, every time we did an album, we always had like one of those songs. We had one called The Rush that was on uh, um, uh, Power Love, which actually was a kill, killer song. Yeah. But you know, but, but that's weird. But you know what? There comes a time. There comes a time when you go and you reach a certain place. And you know, when it came down to it, I had nothing left to give them. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean, yeah, I mean? After eight, eight albums is is a long run for any any right. producer, any artist. Well, and and with Marcus, you know, ten years, and he was a yeah. wandering spirit. He wanted to do and play live more and create his own solo stuff because right. he saw where the where, where the music business was going, and he turned down a couple of lucrative production deals, which probably would have included me, but yeah. that just had me going. But you know what? When I started producing, I had to start from scratch. Right. Yeah, because you have you because, have a record, a track record as a, as a synthesis, as a player, but the producing is a different thing. Exactly, because they got to give you, and, they and, have to cop exactly. up the money, and you're exactly you're, you're the guys yeah, exactly. sign the checks. Yeah, exactly. And a couple of friends, one friend of mine, Arnie Holland, he had his own company, and he started saying, "I want to give you some work. I want to start." So he started giving me some work and everything. And what happened was that you know from there, I did the UN 50th anniversary project called mm -hmm. People, was a right. movie with with this. I got an Emmy nomination for it. You know. And then I started doing some work for Sony, but there was an evil vibe going on up there, man. And somebody was really sabotaging my stuff. Man. And it was really painful. It was a friend, painful. And I didn't know whether I wanted to go and continue, but 
my friend Jay Beckenstein from Spyro Gyra. I love Jay. He wanted, yeah. me, to, he wanted, he wanted me to produce some stuff on his solo album. Awesome. And so when I produced Black Market by Weather Report, right. Jay, Jay said to me, There's it, that's it, man. You got to do a whole album of Weather Report songs. And I was like, yeah, he goes, you, you kidding me? This thing's great, man. And I started thinking, okay. And it took me a while, but I got a deal for that. And that's how everything then started really Yeah, I was going to say, because you actually, um, you got into a whole groove where you've been doing some really successful tribute albums, um, different groups. And, and tell me, tell me how, yeah. how is that, was that sort of the beginning of that, that whole thing? Well, well, that was, that was, that was well, one of the reasons why, why I did that in a lot of ways, because I had a great Rolodex, man, you know, from all <laughs> right. of those years in, in, yeah. in the studio. I'm in there, you know, like I, I'm in there with like, you know, uh, well, first of all, I met Will Lee in 1970 Corp. So I, he doesn't count. I love, we were, I love with, Will. He's a sweetheart. Yeah. Yeah. Will has, Will has, you know how many records Will has played on for me and how many gigs he's done for me? <laughs> he's about to do something for me also coming up. Awesome. And uh, uh, yeah, singing this new Yvonne Lynn's track that we've written. Right. And, 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 and so what happens was that, you know, I, I you know, I, I knew them and everything like that, but, you know, but I'd be in the studio and I'd see, you know, like these different people. Hey, man, can I get your number? Yeah, sure, man. Hey, it was great hanging with you today. But Joe Sample was a friend of mine, you know, right. and Joe doing the Crusaders project with that. I got him. He played on some of my stuff, you know. I always yeah. call the people and they go, Jason, what is it, man? Well, I thought a lot about it and I think you could do this and I'll pay you this amount of money and I'll pay you right on the spot. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's go. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, and I always <laughs> learned that. I you can't turn that, that down. Got, well, the whole thing is, you you know, you can if it's the pain in the ass. Right. But I right. always said, but I, but, but my whole thing was that, man, you got to respect the cats, man. And you're going to be respected back and you're going to get friends back because you keep your business straight. Right. Yeah. That's the most important thing that people don't even realize that when you keep your business straight, you know, all of a sudden the level of respect to you comes back up a yeah. lot. Yeah, and just be, so, being you know, nice, being prepared and paying guys, yeah. right? Like it's real simple. And having but... good music, having right. having everything together so they can walk in and do their thing. Right. You know, so so what happened was that by like 1999, you know, man, I had done the people project where I had tons of amazing people on it. And I just said, no. So I was like, we were struggling, man. And I and some of my friends, you know, knew what we were going through. And I said, "Would you do this weather report album?" Absolutely, man. So it was Michael and Randy yeah. and Sanborn and Marcus, Steve Gadd, Vinny. You know, all of these great people played on the record. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which which didn't stop some people from writing on Amazon.com. Die, Jason Miles, die. <laughs> you know. Hey, or, you uh, know what? Do, what, or, what can or, you do? <laughs> or if I saw Jason Miles right now. If I said Jason Miles right now, I would definitely buy a gun and shoot him. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of shit that they were writing on Amazon because they thought that I was going into hollow ground. And then oh my God. You get the other people going, well, this album is brilliant. Yeah. He, just, he didn't say he was Weather Report. He right. said he was celebrating the music of That's, Weather Report. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you love that yeah, stuff. Yeah, you know those guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And Joe was happy I did it. Joe and Wayne made freaking shitload of money on that. Right, record. exactly. Their songs, <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and it was number one in Japan and everything like that. But that yeah. album led to a love affair. But that album, The Love Affair, came, well, first of all, Weather Report was my favorite band, and Joe was my friend, and Wayne was a friend, and so right. I wanted to do this, you know what I mean? Yeah, it was, it was, it was actually it, a real tribute, not just making money yeah, tribute, right? Right, right. But, well, 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 the whole thing is, they, um, you know, they had been broken up already for 15 years, and yeah. people forgot about them, and I said, okay, well, it's not like I'm going and they're on the road and doing a tribute to them. Right, you know? exactly. I'm yeah. going, and I want to get other generations into Weather Report, man, you know? And so, you know, with these tribute albums, okay, the Yvonne record, that had to happen because of Miles, you know? And yeah. so, you know, I took it. But what I did with all those records is that I made them my own. I didn't make them like a quickie tribute type of thing. I mean, I crafted the shit out of those records to really make yeah. them something special. And what happened was that right as I was making the Yvonne album and everything, Grover died. Mm -hmm. And I was yeah. talking to Kathy and I said to Kathy, you know, man, I hate to say it, but I got to do an album, man, a tribute to Grover before somebody does it and screws it up. Right. Yeah, because you somebody right. said, yeah. Right. And so I did it and I made it right to grow with love. So 150,000 copies, you know, Awesome. but, and, but, but then after that, you know, like I wasn't doing like some real tributes, but I was doing kind of like revisioning things. Like I met Reggie Young and the Memphis guys mm -hmm. and Reggie was started to become a great friend. So I put together this project called soul summit yeah. with Reggie, Steve Ferroni and uh, Bob Babbitt. And we were the rhythm section. Yeah, I love and then Bob. we had and, yeah. and, uh, Bob was, like, Oh my God. I know. See yeah. what I mean by we're missing these guys. He's I mean, a sweetheart. Like, yeah. Jason, what's going on? How you doing? <laughs> what's happening? There's so much, you, you know, know? Bob Babbitt. I mean, I'm glad they did the stat and standing in the shadows of Motown because oh, yeah. Bob, Bob is a name that, uh, you know, 
musicians know, ba- bass players, that kind of, I mean, I'm a bass player, right. but like the general public, of course, didn't know, which is the whole story of that film and also right. the Wrecking Crew. And like Bob, like he had such an interesting history. At one point he was a wrestler. <laughs> right, he was. Yeah, it's funny. Bob Kreiner. Yeah, 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 it's funny. That's his name, Bob. Bob but he, Bob, played on, Bob. he played on some of the Marvin stuff. He played on, I mean, oh, just yeah. legendary stuff. Midnight, bass player. Midnight Train to Georgia. Right. You know, yeah. you yeah. know, so if you want to see the Soul Summit video is on YouTube live. Ah. You okay. can see you can see live. It's with Reggie and Bob, and I have a great guitar player for sure. I brought Steve Ferroni, right, Carl yeah. Denson, yep. and then I had Susan Tedeschi and Mike Madison from the Tedeschi Trucks band, and yeah, it was great. great man. So I did a couple great. of those. We, we we did a couple of those, and we got to hang out with Bob, you know. And I said, mm-hmm. you know, one day I called him up on the phone because I wanted him to do something, and uh, he said, listen to this, and I got to tell you something. I was on the phone, and it sounded terrible, and I said, uh, you know, I'm going to be cool, man. Bob, are you okay? Oh yeah. Everything's great. Bill came in. So the next morning, I get a phone call <coughs> from this woman with, Hi, Jason. I'm so and so. I'm the studio manager where Bob was doing and everything. Look, I got to tell you this, man. It's very difficult, but Bob has brain cancer. Uh, so. And so I know that what you were hearing was not Bob at all. He was something going on. But I'm just telling uh, you, man, this yeah. is what's happening. And that it was like a quick descent from there. Mm. you know yeah i was i actually interviewed uh denny tedesco tommy's son oh, yeah, there and, you go. You know, yeah he produced the wrecking crew and then it took him 12 years to get that done but when they did if you've if you've seen the film there's a big part of the yeah. thing where they're sitting around the table the card table and they're talking tommy and how blame and, and yeah. you know tommy was, was already very sick when they filmed that and then a lot yeah. of those guys you know two years later a lot of those guys were gone so like those kind of legendary people you know, and we we've well, all we've, we've all grown up hearing them, jazz musicians, all oh, these yeah. guys that we love. Oh, yeah. And it, it's when they're gone, it's like you like with the tribute thing. You want you want the music to carry on. You want to introduce new generations to that music. Well, right? well, well, well. You know, Reggie, who played on 150 top 40 hits. Right. You know, son of a preacher man, drift away. Yeah, just you know, legendary. Uh, yeah. yeah, legendary. He was a very dear friend uh, of mine. Very dear. I helped him get his first record out and everything. You know. But, you know, but like, you know, you know, Reggie would tell me stories that were crazy. He told me stories about recording with Elvis. He told me stories about he told me stories about playing with the Beatles. Reggie wow. opened up for the Beatles. Crazy. The first American tour with Bill Black's combo. And he was there. George Funny. Harrison loved the way he played. And he was showing George how to bend strings. They were right. hanging out in Key West together. He says, but it was did it. But it was crazy. He said, you know, yeah. it was totally crazy. And then he went to the UK because there was a deal. Well, like if you were an English act touring in the United States, you had to have an American act on the show. Oh, and if you were an, and, and if you were an American act coming to the UK, you had to have an English act on the show. That's funny. So it was a yeah. union agreement. There was a oh. union agreement. So, you know, so he would tell me these stories and everything like that. You know, but, you know, Elvis he said, you know, when, when Elvis was in the studio, he was amazing. And mm-hmm. the minute his guys came back, he was an asshole. Yeah, the mafia you know guys. I mean? Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. Like, you know, in the studio, he was like, you know, well, that's okay. Reggie goes, no, Elvis, I want to do it again, man. I got to get this right, you know. And he yeah. knew the seriousness of the record that he wanted to do, you know, because right. he was so talented. Because they had all these other songs for him, man. And Chips Moman wouldn't do the music because he thought the songs sucked. <laughs> and so he had a fight with Elvis's publisher in the room there and everything like that. And uh, he's and, yeah. and so Elvis walks in and Chips goes, I don't care who the hell you are. We make hits here. And if you want hits, you come here. He goes, these songs aren't hits. And Elvis goes, well, let's hear what you got. And so he plays them like In the Ghetto, right. and The Suspicious yeah. Minds. And Elvis goes, we're cutting those tracks. Yeah. You know? And they spent all week in the studio with Elvis, you know, making that album. Crazy. And, everything. Yeah. and he wanted to take the band on the road with him and everything, but they didn't want any part of going on the road. Yeah, because back back in those days, like that, they talk about that, the Wrecking Crew, like those guys, they were going on the road. They were making way yeah. too much money <laughs> sitting in LA. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Reggie, York, ended right? up going, Reggie ended up going and playing with the Highwaymen, you know? Yeah. I said, I, I said, you know, well, you know, look, man, there's going on the road and then there's going on the road. Yeah, there's and going on the road with Johnny Cash. If you're on the road with Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Merle, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, right. Jennings and Chris Christopherson, you're not exactly flying second class. Exactly. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> exactly. So he went out and he did it. And you can see that the highwaymen live at the uh, Nassau Coliseum, he plays. But, you know, but this is all the things, you know, but I, co- I collected a lot of names, you know, for the different mm-hmm. projects. Right. But I want to look when I when I did Sly Reimagined with my with this global noise band that I have that I still have an album in the can mm-hmm. and I'm waiting to release at the right time. Yeah, because it's so fresh and it's so interesting. And, and I worked very, very hard on, on to create a concept for that. But, you know, uh, you, you know, you know, you know, you know, seeing, you know, seeing what, what, the, what the story was, you know, I took 
And I really thought about it. And I called my friend who was a drummer, Stephen Wolf, asking him, could you play drums? And he goes, you know what I mean? You got to call Greg Rico, the original drummer. I know him and he's a great guy. I bet he would love to do it. I said, you think that guy's going to come? He played on almost the whole album, Greg. How awesome. Yeah. You know? So, you know, so I was able to go and always able to find those right people right. to go that, into. That's, that, that's a big part of being a producer is creating the right stew of musicians, oh, yeah. right? Oh, well, I, I learned that, though. I was in the studio with the masters, with Tommy LaPuma, mm -hmm. Russ Teitelman, you right. know, Phil Ramone. I mean, I saw these guys work, man. Arif Martin, I never worked with Arif, but he was a friend, and I always would yeah. talk to him and everything, you know. Herbie Mann and people like that, you know. Yeah, I mean, legendary, I learned, legendary yeah, folks. I learned yeah. from them how to make that. Tommy showed me how to, Tommy, without him showing me, of course, I, I learned how to run a, a session with Tommy. Yeah. He knew how to run a session like a freaking bullet point, man, you know, yeah. and I learned that. I, and, and you know what? I, there's so many other things that you learn that are like just the uh, intangibles. Yeah, you know? and a lot of that's just paying attention, right? And there's a reason yeah. why these guys are so successful. There's a reason why Quincy yeah. had so many hits and David. And oh, yeah. Guys. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things was also, you know, was that, uh, you know, you know, Tommy would always go, hey, I mean, I think we need to eat. What do you think? Yes, you know, let's get some pasta. I'll call up uh, Latanzi and have them come here and <laughs> yeah. deliver food to us, you know. And they would deliver amazing food to us. And he was right. a real bon vivant, you know. And we go out to L.A. and hang with Luther and go to places. I mean, you know, it, th these were times of really being able to learn. I learned how to produce albums and make yeah. a record. See, right. right now, you have kids going in the studio. I'm telling you, they are recording music. OK, they're recording and everything. They're not they're not making records. Right. They're making singles as their as their whole mindset. Which I don't is a whole different, that's they, a whole they, different thing, right? They're recording music but yeah. they're not creating it as a record. It's not crafted a certain way. Right. Where are those instrumental hooks that, that always made some of these things better? It's yeah. all like, you know, pro tools with the pro, with the presets, with the, you know, the, 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 the drums a certain way. There comes the lo-fi, there's yeah. some effects, right. there's some yeah. other shit. There's like it, no bridge, there's anything, there's a chorus. They're not making their own sounds really, it's just samples. Right, so, yeah. right. And they're all going and they're all singing stuff that doesn't have any kind of compositional flow. Right. And I always think about that because these guys, you know, a lot of the legends are Quincy. These guys are still around. And, and like, I listen to everything. I'm like you, like I listen to, I'll listen to everything from metal to jazz to, and, and I think you can really learn from that, but you have to be open to learning and paying attention. Right. That was the key though. But that's the whole thing. I yeah. studied electronic music in New York and learned how to do that. Then I studied classical piano with somebody for 18 years, Yeah, you know, and, and I studied bebop with somebody. Man, so I you develop your vocabulary, right? Exactly. You know, I mean, I never knew a lot of these pro these artists and everything like that in 1974. But when I started studying piano with Mike Melilla, who was a genius jazz teacher, he got me into really got me into Bill Evans, the real good Bill Evans stuff, you know, right. portrait and jazz. Everybody digs Bill Evans, you know, but Powell, Poco Loco and Parisian's thoroughfare and these things and Monk. You know, yeah. all these great people he got me into, du early Duke Ellington. And I started going. And from there, we started building. And then hanging out with the Brazilians in New York. I got to check out Milton Nascimento in 1974. Yeah. Nobody knew who Milton was. Klub de Esquina. You know, I heard all this stuff from the very beginning, man, of his, of his inception. And it yeah. really had a big effect on me. And that's why I kind of look at yeah, myself. Yeah, the Brazilians, like, the Puerto Ricans, like all of the other really oh, yeah. interesting stew of Latin jazz. And, oh, yeah. yes, man. And and the Brazilians in New York, that was the first wave of cats, you know, that came in. So I met them all. And, you know, yeah, it was it was a very heady time, you know. Tell, and me, then, tell me about, uh, you know, not to, to, to back up. Yes, but please. Gonna, yeah. But um, you so. Right before all this COVID mess started, you had just released your album Black Magic. Yes. Um, so tell me about that. And then you also you're developing a one man show. You've got a book going right. on. You've got a lot of stuff right. happening. So look, tell me about all that stuff. Sure. And then this other album I'll tell you about also that I'm very excited okay. about too. Awesome. Uh, but, but, but what happened was that you're like I have this band kind of new, which came from which came from me seeing Miles one day, and uh, saying to him Miles. Man, I was listening to Bitches Brew the other day, man, 1988. I said, you know what, man? I love that album, man. But I got to ask you something. You had like on, on a, you, you, Turby started playing the roads and Chick was playing the Fender Roads. Joe Zavala was playing the Fender Roads. Larry Young, man, you know? Yeah. Said, Come on, man. Who, who, who is your favorite cat playing the electric piano? And he said to me, and he said to me, Keith Jarrett. And I'm going, Keith Jarrett? I had no idea that Keith Jarrett was it. I mean, I know he played on a song on Why There's Evil, a lot of people on that it. record. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you know? Yeah. So 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 I said, Keith Jarrett. He goes, Jason, Keith is a funky motherfucker, man. So I didn't know anything, okay? Yeah. And, and, and what happened was that 20 years later, 
I was at the IAJE and supposedly Bob Belden and Adam Holzman found the legendary Celador tapes of the Miles Celador band that had Jack, Jack DeJohnette, Michael right. Henderson, Keith on Fender Roads, Gary Bartz and Ayerto. And, uh, okay. and, 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 and so one day Bob, Bob's yelling at me, this like, Miles, come here, man, come here, man. You know, What's on? I got something for you. So the next day I go back and he can't be this, this thing, six set disc of the Celador session. Wow. And I hear Keith, I hear Keith and I'm going, holy shit. Yeah. Keith is blowing my living mind away on this stuff, man. You know, and of course he told everybody he hates it. Oh, I hate it. I hate it. Man. He always like happy, smiling all the time. <laughs> playing. You know, exactly. You know, Keith is just thieving, you know? So anyway, yeah. so what happened with it, I started saying, you know what? I need to address this because this is the small electric ensemble that's disappeared. Right. And I want to do something like that where you can go and you can have the melodies centered and focused, but you can then go and start creating new music in front of people with these incredible musicians if you yeah. have it down. So I spent time and I started writing. And then I hooked up with this trumpet player that I that I that I knew for many years, Ingrid Jensen. I thought, that, OK, well, this will be very cool. And I'll bring Ingrid in and everything, you know. And so, you know, I started writing this material and uh, we made this first album called Just Kind of New. And it got rave, rave, rave reviews everywhere. People thought it was the best Ingrid was playing. Awesome. Trumpa plays were calling up Ingrid and everything. Yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it didn't work out with her. Mm. You know, um, it happens. you know, yeah. well, it does happen. But, you know, when somebody doesn't appreciate what you've done, you know, mm -hmm. th that that's a that's a problem. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah. and and, you know, and, and when somebody looks at it another way and, and it starts not to turn into the team, then you got to do something. Yeah. And so I went to Europe. I went to Europe and, and I went and I uh, did a press tour by myself that my agent over there got me because I was producing an album in London for this beautiful jazz singer, Beverly Byrne. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that, you know, I, the writers were so thrilled to hear from me and everything because nobody ever really talked about me. You oh. know, no, yeah. nobody ever really talked about me. You know, they were all too into their own vibe. And so they thought, yeah. wow, Jason, this is great. That's great. And so Stephanie goes, I came back after the Paris terror attack. And I wrote this tune called Blue is Paris. And I turned it into like 12 different tracks, okay? Yeah. And that was kind of an experiment. But then Stephanie said to me, you need to make a new kind of new album. You need to make something, you know, so we can start from scratch something on Something fresh, yeah. You know? you know? So what happened was that um, I go and I start thinking, you know, that's a good idea. That is a good idea. So I, so I, I start to write some songs. But Reggie was coming over to New York from Brussels, Reggie Washington, with Stephanie, the, uh, my agent. And I said, here, you know, we just got done touring. What's an incredible tour we did. And I said, let's get together and do a live gig and I'll record it and we can have the basis of an album. So we cut these live tracks with the same band that I toured with in Europe because I awesome. played all the hip places, all the great places. And we got amazing reviews. I got four star review from the London Financial Times and everything. Yeah. It was great. So anyway, I had these tunes. So I started writing some new tunes because I wanted to make it like I had the same guys in the studio and the same guys live to show people that right. live is live and studio is studio. Yeah, and and often so anyway, often this is the case that what what you're hearing live is not the guys that played on the record. That that's right, yeah. exactly. But that's so I had these guys, you know, you know, do it because they were brilliant and the, and the live stuff was great. But then something happened. Herbie Hancock was playing down at the um, the Bergen Pack, mm -hmm. and I I said, oh my god, we got to see Herbie. Tickets were 150 dollars a piece. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, dude, I really got it. Like oh, I used to yeah, save yeah, in the oh, village yeah. for like $20. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, but what happened was that James Genus and Vinnie Cagliuta and Lionel yeah. Luecki were playing with them. And I know them. So I called up James and Vinnie and they got his comps. And I went and I saw Herbie and it was breathtaking, man. It was amazing. And, I, and, and, and so after talking to Herbie and seeing him, we hung for a little while and everything. I saw Vinny and James and, you know, just was so inspiring. And was just talking to me was so because I had known Herbie. We had done some, a couple of things before that. Yeah. And what happened was that I got very inspired. I came home and listened to the music. I threw all the songs away and I started writing new songs. Huh? And so the four songs that you hear on Black Magic are the yeah. new songs that I, that I did when I went. And all oh, the record starts coming out. I got to deal with Rope a Dope. And all of a sudden, we got a sold out tour in France of the first of a few coming up. And covid right yeah yeah that and so all, and all of us it's like now what do i do absolutely absolutely <laughs> yeah, absolutely yeah. and so everybody and, and so what happened with that it took a few months but i decided you know i'm not going to let this record die yeah. so that's when i decided to cut two more tracks awesome. i have two new tracks for the for this so i'm going to release those in a in, in a few months after the summer hopefully that's a great idea man but thank you and, and they're killer killer yeah. total killer one of them i have randy brecker as a special guest on awesome awesome well you know what i figured if i'm gonna do this i gotta go for the gusto 
Yeah, you got to do you it know? like for real and yeah, for sure. Yeah. So so I got the same guys playing. It's still Reggie and Jay Rodriguez and uh Gene Lake, but I but I got Randy to play to, to play instead of this guy Philip Dizak. Awesome. And and then we do this tune. It's about that time from Miles. I took the live track. So we got a live track and a studio track, kind of balance everything. Yeah. But like the one man, the one man show thing, I've been working on that for 10 years. Wow. Okay. And and, and I learned because I've got a lot of stories. I've got a lot, yeah. a lot of stories. And a you, lot that, of stories. that stuff needs people want to know that stuff. They want to know oh, what it no. was like working with Miles and all. I mean, all, it's yeah. so much history. First hand. Yeah. Yeah. First hand, right. right? But not like, well, you know, I saw him and then my friend told me that you know, I'm there, <laughs> exactly, man. I got, exactly. I got mild stories that you, I got mild stories you won't even believe. Yeah, I got Luther Lu- stories that are crazy, say, man. Because you know? people love Shaka, Luther. Shaka, Luther, yeah. all the stories about all of these amazing things, you know, Gato Barbieri, you know, I mean, all yeah. these incredible stories. And so what happened was that I, 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 I saw Chris Rock on TV and I saw Jerry Seinfeld on TV and Jerry. Where's Danny? He goes, what you been doing? He goes, well, I've been breaking and stuff. Well, how do you break and stuff? Well, the other night it was two o'clock in the morning and I couldn't sleep. And I was thinking about this riff that I was doing. Riff and I, was, I called up the comedy club and I said, hey, you got, you, are you still open yet? Do you have any time if you want to come down and do 20 minutes? Yeah, there's still people here. So he takes his Porsche, parses it right in front of the club, <laughs> goes in there, jumps on stage and gives it a workout and see how it goes right, for 20 yeah. minutes to see if he can do it. And if that works, he starts seeing how he can integrate it. Well, that's right. what I did. The, at the beginning, the show was scattered some, and it was scattered over there. But then I understood how to start bringing it more together. Yeah, and tightening then, it up. You know, and... you know, the last few years, I was you know doing the Soul Train. I, I was did the Soul Train cruise, and I got yeah. to do it on the Soul Train cruise a couple of times. And I said, "Oh yeah, this works. People love this man. They yeah. couldn't get enough of the stories." And you know what happened was that I said, "Okay, this is what I have to do." But but how also had everything got tied in was that we were on stage in Vienna with the band. And uh, it was the last night of Porgy and Bess. Mm. And uh, we had played and the place was freaking screaming, man. They were clapping and standing and everything was wonderful. Beautiful, beautiful moment. So we went off stage and I said, you know, we don't have any more tunes, man. We just did an encore. And now they want us to go and do another song. And everything. Right. what do we can do? I said, you know what? You come out. I'll start a groove. OK, they'll love it for five minutes. We'll all just do something crazy and it'll be a lot of fun. Everybody, Great idea. Let's go. So anyway, I go out. I walk out on the stage. I'm sitting down. I turn around. There's nobody there. Nobody walks out on the stage with me, you know, and the, and, 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 and they're going to play, man, go ahead, play something. You know? So I start playing solo piano yeah. and it goes over really well. And I walk backstage and Jay Rodriguez tells me, hey, man, this is your next album. I'm going, what? The solo piano album. You got to do that, man. You get the stuff over. I see what you're doing because I'm very melodic concentrated. Right. All my music has got mel- melodic content to it, you know. And so I went and I as, practiced. As it like, yeah, well, hello. <laughs> yeah, That's exactly. another story. In I know, I know, another I know. three hours. You know, I'll tell you I about know. that. I know. Um, you, you know, but this, you know, you know, the, you know, the story is, 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 is that you know. So I came home and I practiced for four months, and I did half an album on Fender Rhodes, half an album on Steinway Grand, awesome. right. and 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 I'm writing this book called The Extraordinary Journey of Jason Miles, which I have to tell you something. I'm very proud to say it's almost done. I'm very wow. close to being done. Very and that's a huge that's a huge project right it's like what do i what all, what do i include what what do i not include exactly well you know <laughs> it's, what it's i could have i, I could have but so so just to get in, in, into that so i decided you know what man i'm going to release the album and the book at the same time ah, you right. know try to build live shows after that because nobody got to spend a lot of money for me to do my solo show and i right. could bring a special guest with me you know yeah. And, 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 you know, play it all over the world and everything like that, which is what I want to do. I'm bringing Kathy and tour this because I got the stories to tell them, the music to play yeah. and having this book and everything like that could be really, really cool. I did yeah, not it throw all, it all ties under it the together. Bus. Yeah. I did, did, you know what? I can't throw people under the bus because I'm only telling the truth. Right. You know, and I'm not coming from emotion. I'm going into personal facts of what happened. Yeah. And, you know, there's going to be some there's going to be some people I just, you know, tell, but most of the time, even people that I had problems with, I didn't throw them under the bus because yeah. I realized that and they hired guys, me. And there's I guys get... like Miles, too. They're just they're just complicated guys, but they're so talented. Oh, yeah. And like, you oh, know, yeah. and it's not it, those stories are like, I mean, I, I've talked to some of the folk, other folks that have worked with Miles and it's great stories like it's, oh. it's and, and, and it's a, i have my unique crazy stuff stories. but <laughs> uh, you know I, I have i have my unique stories like you know how i met him and what he yeah, said to yeah. me you know and, right. and you know and, and i said to him you know he had a very affectionate name for me for a week after i met him you know 
And, uh, you know, and I know that he was just affectionately calling me Whitey, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, until you know, when, he does I, that, when he does that, you kind of go, okay, hey, hey, he's, at least yeah, he's, he's mild. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, uh, but, you know, but, but, but a week after that, man, when we were really listening down to the record and he was listening to man, he knew something was going down and saw me working. And all of a sudden he goes, hey, Jason, I want you to try something. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, I'm Jason now. You know what I mean? Okay. I'm not, I'm not I graduated. <laughs> I'm not Whitey anymore. You know, but the whole thing is, you know, so so I write about all of the stuff in the book and it's called The Extraordinary Journey of Jason Miles, a musical awesome. biography. Yeah. And so I'm going to try to go and, you know, get 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 make it so I can release the book and the album at the same time as a bundle. Yeah, it's a great idea. You know, I mean, I think and, it's and, that's, that you're telling the story of how all that stuff was made. And that I mean, again, like oh, that yeah. whole time period is so magical. There's so oh, yeah. much that that 70s, 80s, a lot of just legendary music created great, and, you know so many stories and it's not a memoir right it's not a memoir it's it, it's it's a group of essays and stories and observations right. that's yeah. what i'm saying i'm born in brooklyn yes i sort of of course i cover brooklyn some but i but i'm telling stories it's not like in some chronological order you know what yeah, i mean yeah, yeah. the making yeah. of tutu power of love you know right. this album that album and, and then i have a whole section called people i've met along the way yeah. And uh, I talk about a tour that we did, you know, that, that, that the global noise tour that was insane. You know, I mean, just to bring people into the world of what was going on a lot more rather right. than and my mother told me and I went to this, you know, <laughs> they don't want to they don't want to know that, man. They want the, yeah. they want stories like, for real. They want the real, That's the what real I, deal. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't throw anybody under the bus. I tell the truth about some people and some people may have to problem. But if it was a real serious thing, I didn't mention the, the, the name. I said, I don't want to create something that I want to I want to just bring people on the journey and them seeing it. Right. They think it's so important that they got to know who that person is. I named plenty of names in this book, plenty of names, you know, <laughs> but but nobody wants yeah. to hear. Well, I went into the bathroom and I caught, you know, like, you know, like it, it, it's. Throwing somebody into the bus. It's about and not the music. Everybody. It's not about the. Well, yeah, it's not about. Yeah. So, so, so it's like you know the first day of tutu when I walked in and I walked into the bath. I went to the bathroom. The door was locked, and so uh, I said, "Okay, somebody's <laughs> in here." So I just stood, so I just stood by the yeah. back, and the door opened up, and it was Tommy. Okay. Yeah, right. And I walked in there, and I'm going, "Holy shit! This room smells like freaking Hawaii, man." You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You know? So I guess that's as far as throwing under the bus that you know. Yeah, comes, yeah, you know? Yeah, but I think, yeah, but, yeah. but he didn't give Tommy the freaking that smoke pot like crazy. Yeah, it was the times, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I just didn't get into some ugly shit that I that I saw, and yeah. we saw some real ugly stuff. I'm and sure. I don't think that it. Uh, yeah, I don't think yeah. that that's it. I don't want to bring people in there and dredge that up in lives again. You right. know, but I do want to tell some stories, you know, about how Marcus and I spent fifty dollars a piece on milkshakes one day. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yoga shakes. You know, you know, you're making too much money when you're spending fifty dollars on a milkshake. <laughs> yeah. No, or you, or you pulled in front of the, or you, or you pulled in front of the, you know, Humphrey yogurt in L.A. Yeah. and pulled your car in front and got up and ran into place to get the yoga shakes. The next, you know, I mean, the cops are outside ticketing you for a hundred dollars. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like that was these are the most these are the two most freaking expensive yoga yeah. shakes I've ever had, man. You know, it's funny. Funny. you know, you know, these, these, I get you into stories, you know. Like yeah. that, it, it's like I was. It's like I was telling you about the second tune that I did with Luther for the here and now thing. You know, right. we were doing it. All of a sudden, we're doing it. It's coming out. You know, we're working. We're working on that on a Sunday afternoon. And Marcus goes, you know, let's split. Okay. What well, it goes, you know, and I like what I got, but I don't know if I'm going to like it in two hours. Let's go to Westwood and play video games. Yeah, yeah. let's That's go. Good, yeah. You know, All right. Yeah, you know, but but you know what? I learned something from that. I learned when you think you got something, leave it. Right. And, and come, back come back to it. Yep. Yeah. And see if you like it. And I guarantee you, man, that like half the time you're gonna come back. Oh, I don't like that shit. Yeah, and then half the time you're gonna go, wow, that's pretty good. Oh, you know what? I like those two bars. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah, I'm like well, that with photography. I'll be editing and editing. I'm like, you know what? I need a break. And then you come back and right. go, Yeah, that sucks. Let's start over. <laughs> you know, right. You know, well, you know, you, you, need fre you need fresh eyes and fresh ears. And you know one of the things that's very important to me in the future, besides going out and performing now, my the show and bringing black magic and kind of new back out on the road, right. trying to do more weather report gigs, which came out fantastic. Because I was bringing Carter Beaufort from Dave Matthews with us, with yeah, Jeff Coffin. Great, great player. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, 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 they had off and we were doing these weather report gigs and it was really great. But, you know, but I also am at the point where like over that time I produced a bunch of independent artists. Mm -hmm. And this last thing that I just finished with this girl, Rebecca Angel, it's phenomenal. I'm going to send it to you. It's, it's a yeah. phenomenal yeah. album. It came out just like 
like a like a nineteen eighties production. I mean, modern and everything, but the whole way we did yeah. it with crafting the parts and getting the right people. And right. this record is extraordinary. And I need to go and I need to put myself out there more in the public about you need to come to me to learn how to make a real record if you want to have a real career. If right. you want to just do something and be part of the crew, that's okay. If you want to learn how to be an artist and if you want to know how to make a real album with great songs and great vibes or great singles or whatever, I'm here. You should come to me because I can help you get to that place. And you know, I really want to do that. Yeah. And a big thing too is like, you know, you talk about like the kids making the record at home on their laptop. Like, you know, a big part of the records that you made are collaborations, are bringing oh, yeah. in great musicians, great artists, getting them all in the same room and creating together. Right. That's oh, yeah. a big, a big thing. But also, but also, but also part of the deal was that what I've learned is I've learned how to make it sound like that. Right. I've learned how to craft records where you don't have to be in the same room. And that's how Rebecca's record. Rebecca has got the best musicians in the world on her record. You know why? Because everybody was around. Exa yeah, everybody everybody was wanted to work. <laughs> exactly. Everybody, everybody yeah. was everybody was available. Right. We have all these amazing musicians making this. And, and, you know, we had a number one song from the album with For What It's Worth. Um, it, it was on five uh, uh, AC charts that wow. we got number one on. And yeah. I think that she's got a bright future to it. But this is what I know how to do. I know yeah. how to go and really work with the artists. I've taken all different kinds of artists. I had a judge from Savannah, Georgia come and he was a guitar player and he wanted to play with the New York Cats until he figured out that he wasn't good enough to play with the New York Cats. <laughs> and I and, and 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 then he came back home and then he went back home and he woodshedded for two months and then got back to me and he was playing great. He's, I mean, I learned a lot of stuff about this man, you know. Awesome. And and I work with some independent artists that you know that I really was able to make something happen for. Right. And that's yeah. what I'm trying to do. So I'm going to do a series of videos and a little solicitation and see what's happening. Yeah. Because, you know, and also, you know, Kathy and I are trying to move overseas. We're trying to move to Portugal. Yeah. Because yeah. because I think that overseas, I think I, I think my one man show would go over really well there. Yeah. And they and in Europe, especially, they really appreciate especially oh, the yeah. stories and they love American music. And all oh, those yeah. artists are still hugely popular there. And also in oh, Asia, yeah. you're talking about Japan too. Like that, that oh, yeah. stuff is, is gold there. It's still oh, gold. Yeah. oh yeah, absolutely, man. And you know, when, when I started telling stories, you know, um, when I do some interview, you know, people just, they can't get enough of it. They can't get enough of mile stories. And my mile stories are crazy <laughs> Yeah, yeah. because they're one-on-one, -on -one, you know, right. in his apartment, making music in his apartment or, you know, uh, you know, calling me up at midnight, telling me he needed me to come over to his house and then, you know, just talk up for the next three hours. <laughs> I know, or, yeah, the crazy. He has, uh, a, lot, he has a, fun, a lot of fun stories about him. <laughs> exactly, but he was a complex guy. Yeah, right. But he's a genius. He's a genius, you know. Well, of course he was. He invented yeah. jazz all of this time. So, you know, so all I'm trying to do is now that I'm turning 70 in June, mm -hmm. I want to just try to take the next phase and, you know, get yeah. as much as I can. And I got inspired, man, from Herbie and Chick. Yeah, you know, and 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 your chick left us, man. And I, I know he was having so much here. fun doing the stuff at home during COVID. Like I, he, I he loved was. watch. I loved watching that because you really saw the child spirit in him, and exactly. like the, well, he'd so, sit there and play drums, so, and you know, exactly. What, what was so beautiful to me was that he called me out several times when awesome. he was uh, doing that. You know, he would read yeah. people's names that were there and everything. And he goes, "Hey, Jason Miles is here. Jason, hey, what's <laughs> happening, man?" And I was like. I can't believe this, man. I'm sitting at home and Chick Corea is calling me out for right, like yeah. thousands of people. Because yeah. he's still like, you know, he's still like Jason's a great, yeah, Jason's a great musician, man. Yeah, you should check his stuff. Out. I mean, Chick's awesome. saying this stuff, and I'm saying to myself, what do I need in this life, man? You know, I mean, Roberta Flack said something about me that was beautiful. Miles called me a right. genius, yeah. and was, what do I need? Do I, you know, I don't have to say anything to anybody. It's there for them to see. Yeah, you know, yeah. and I well, and, awesome, and, and I try yeah. to be as humble as possible. You the know, you have to be as humble as possible. The thing about it, Jason, is that you've had, I mean, like I was saying, when I looked at your discography and your, your history, it's just so deep. And like, literally, we could go for hours because it's so much there. Oh, yeah. And maybe once once you get your um, your next phase, when we start touring, and maybe we can have you come back and talk about what you're, sure. what you're even more what you're going to be doing. And, and there's so many stories um, that we haven't even touched on. But tell me how people can find how people can find you online. I think it's, you have your website, right? Well, I have my website, jasonmilesmusic.com. Awesome. I am on Facebook and I'm on Twitter, Instagram. Yeah, all, all you the know, stuff. Right? <laughs> uh, my phone number is, you know, if you, you know, my email is jasonmiles at mac.com. Okay. And uh, people are more than willing to contact me. You know, like I, awesome. I do a lot of stuff too. I can, I consult with people to help them go. I listen to people's songs. I A and R. Right. songs for people you know i mean uh, it's just this is what you get when you've done it for 46 years yeah i'll tell you a funny thing 
I was at the House of Music in West Orange, New Jersey. And, uh, you know, I used to work there a lot back in the 80s and into the right. 90s. And next door was Cool and the Gang. They had they worked there all the time, you know. So I met Cool and the Gang. But I met their producer, Diodato, Jumia Diodato. Mm -hmm. And he was one of my heroes also. You know, 2001 and all that Carly and Carol right. and yeah, CTI yeah. and everything. Super Strut, you know. And, uh, and, so, and so we started hanging with Diodato. And so I was listening back to like, you know, celebrate and everything when they were mixing. Right. And I said to him, I said to him, you know, there's so many interesting things happening in there. How do you know, you know, what to really go and do, you know? And he goes like this, yep. points to his ear. And I'm going, okay. And I really didn't know whether I understood it. But then as time goes on, I really realized, wow, your ear is very well trained now. You can hear right. a lot of stuff. And, it's, and, and that's what has to happen. You have to learn from that. It, it really bothers me, you know, when I hear about these kids, you know, coming up, yeah, well, I've got my own band. I just got out of school. I got my own band and I'm going to go and, you know, we're, we're going to tour. We're going to do a tour and I'm looking for an agent and everything like that. I'm going, if I came to New York and said that shit, yeah, you know, would have been like, first, hey, listen, my, sit down, my, kid. my first week <laughs> there, you know what I mean by, you know, I'd, I'd be like flying across the freaking river. Nobody would yeah. even give it. They'd be kicking my ass all over. You got to understand how to build and how to do it. And that's going to take time. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, my started getting, I started really getting on the scene. I'd say in like 19, even though I was on the scene, I was elevated to that exalted level about 1984. I had right. been at it 10 years, you know, yeah, 10 time, years I was right? at it, yep. you know, and, and I keep on saying this, you know, well, everybody talks about Chick when he was with Miles. You know, 1968. And then he played before that. He did, you know, the Now He Sings, Now He Sobs. But right. Chick came back to New York in 1959. What was he doing all of those years? You think he was like, well, I'm Chick Corea, man. And that. He was freaking <laughs> scuffling with yeah. a wife and two kids. You know He's what I mean? He's trying to make a living. Was, and yeah. Right, exactly. He wasn't like he's Chick Corea. I mean, he told stories, you know, like about, you know, driving to Rochester. How That's when we met Steve Getty. He did a gig in Rochester that he had to drive to. You know what I mean? Or, or Randy Brecker told this other story about, you know, that they were in a car driving down to Jersey and the tire blew out and all the chick was in the car. You know what I mean? All these things because they thought the gig was going to be cool and it ended up being a real dog of a gig. You know what I mean? But, and these are stuff that it, that it doesn't matter who you are. Yeah, they it's just life. You. It's life. Yeah, right. Yeah. Be, 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 because when you read Herbie's bio, you know, Herbie talks about he came to New York. He couldn't even fucking buy a cheese sandwich. He had no money. Yeah. But that, you know what, that, 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 all that stuff makes you stronger and you learn, like you say, it takes years and then one day right. you wake up and then you're there if you're lucky because to right. get to the point where you got, you guys have been and at your level, um, it's luck, it's hard work, it's just all the stars have to align, right? Well, luck, <laughs> luck, as they say, luck is, uh, luck is, uh, you know, uh, experience meets and, preparation, exactly. you know, luck, you know, it, you know, and, and, and when you have that, when I went into Miles and, and with Miles, man, you know, they didn't really know me. They, some of the guys knew me and everything, but they yeah. didn't they, they didn't know me. But I was put under the seat. And you know what? The minute I walked in that door, man, my confidence and so I was like, I can do this. Yeah, I can definitely do this, man. I can do this. You know, and when I started working with Luther, you know, I said, I can do this. I just need to give give me the time to set everything up the right way. Right. And I can do this. And I've always said that, you know, through everything that I did, whether I was producing or whatever, it, it just seems to always have to come back to you naturally or mm -hmm. else it's not real. Yeah. And I saw that. And I, and I, and I saw that with all of these people, man, I really did. And I saw what it took to get respect. And I saw, you know, all, all these different things. And I try to go in and, and lead those lessons. Right. Yeah. When I saw when the, the last time I saw Joe Zavano, it was a jazz at Lincoln center. We had a, we had, we had at times a cantankerous relationship because he always he was a complicated but, guy too. I, yeah, I he know. was absolutely. Yeah. But what happened, what happened was that after I started working with miles, he didn't know I was working with miles. Uh, he just like, you know, hey, man, this kid's okay, man. He's a good kid. Blah, 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 blah. blah. You know? <laughs> then all of a sudden I'm at miles' house and miles, like, that, he calls miles, he calls miles on the phone. Yeah. And he was in New York and we were going to see him. And, uh, and 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 Joe and Miles goes, you know, well, I got this cat that does synthesizers, man. It's phenom phenomenal, man. Jason Miles, he's my man. Yeah, I go everywhere with him. And Joe was freaked out. You know, and by wow, I didn't think you were going to get that working with Miles. You know, right. so he started treating me really weird, thinking that I was going to come on with some big ego and everything. But I never did. <laughs> yeah. You know, and 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 so the last time I saw him, be the, right before he died, a few months. We were at Jazz and Lincoln Center seeing the Zavano Syndicate. Yeah, and he and we were backstage with him. And he saw me and Kathy, who he met when we were 22, you know, 
I was at a club in New York. I didn't mean we sat and got loaded all day, all night at the club. You know, we were smoking <laughs> joints, at joints yeah. upon joints. You know, the good old days. We love smoking weed, <laughs> right? We love smoking weed. So yeah, anyway, yeah, so yeah. what happened was that, so what, so, so you know, so what happened was that he's in the room and all these people are around. He goes, "Hey, everybody, you see this cat next to me? This cat, this is Jason Miles, man. He's got some bad stuff happening, man. He's a great musician, and How you know awesome. what? He respects the generations that came before him, man. He re- he rep- he respects the generations of musicians that came before him, man. You know, awesome. and awesome. that summed it up. I yeah. never showed the disrespect or anything like that. Yeah. I showed respect to these guys. Ralph McDonald. I work with Ralph McDonald. I brought Ralph to Japan right before he got cancer. Yeah. We did the music of Grover there. So I got to bring Ralph in Japan to exalt his stuff of producing Wine Light and all these albums. You know? Right, right. And, yeah. and that's what happened. And we'd sit in the van and he would tell us stories you know, about Harry Belafonte and this and yeah. that. I'm saying to myself, man, you can't buy this stuff. Exactly, yeah. I mean, like that, that that's the thing. That's so. That's like gold, right? It's like the Miles stuff and all that stuff. It's just so interesting. Oh, yeah. And those those stories, I mean... You know, that fact that you were there and you lived them, like you said, you were the first person there in, in right. the room. And, you know, it's, oh, yeah. it's um, that's like a little window into their lives, especially somebody like Miles, who's so complex and, oh, and, uh, complex. and interesting. But, yeah, but I can see why character. he was complex, yeah. but I can see why he was complex, because when you come and you play and you're in a and, and you're in a country that's a racist country. Right. And then yeah. you go and then you go and you go and you play in France. And you go and play in Europe and they're treating you like a king and you're staying in five star hotels. Exactly. The king of Sweden is honoring you and all this other stuff. You're doing a movie with Jean Moreau and everything, you know, and uh, then you come back to the United States and then you can't use the bathroom in North Carolina. Exactly. Yeah, I know it, it's, it's so, tragic, but well, it's part, I it's figured part, it out. It's part, it's part of their, it's part of what made them as strong as they were. I mean, that, that was you're part absolutely of right. James Brown, same deal, right? Like that he, that's oh, yeah. what made him who he was, you know? It's, absolutely. But, you know, but it's like, it's like really, really interesting because, you know, Miles, Miles would always go, Jason, you know, these white motherfuckers, man, you know, I'm going, he would always say that to me. I'm going, one day I'm at his house. Like, what, do you, what do you say to that? <laughs> well, here's what you say to that. Here's what yeah. you say to that. You say, Miles, look, you know, man, I know what the story is, but you know, but let's face it, you talk to me and everything, but you, and you say that, but I'm a white guy. <laughs> and he said, yeah, and, you know, right? so I'm just trying to figure out, you, you know, and he goes, no, you're you're a musician, man. You yeah, got the heart the and soul, man. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? You got the heart and soul, man. Because those white motherfuckers, and the next thing you know, <laughs> perfect timing on TV, there's Bush and Quail. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And he points to them, and I'm going, Oh, oh, the man. He goes, <laughs> right. You know what I mean? But yeah, so I yeah, said, I Yes, that's it. It's the system. It's not us, it's the system. Right, right, right. Because Miles worked with a lot of white people. Yeah. You know, his, was his, whole career, his whole career was was like that and and like searching out those guys right to work with so yeah dave dave liebman bob berg right uh, you know uh steve grossman chick keith you know yeah along uh, well, you know, yeah. those guys but then then he had jack michael henderson right. gary Bart, train you know and all of those stories man you know what i mean yeah. jimmy cobb uh, I mean, you know, it, 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 it's it's like he had plenty of time to figure out what was happening. Yeah, his actually, you know? and that's the thing, because his, his bands were melting pots, like, and uh, he liked Absolutely. doing that. He liked shoving these guys together and working and kind of pulling the best out of them. And oh, yeah. I mean, that was, that's a big, I mean, his legacy, well, and him and Chick both, like, they have a huge legacy with that. Well, great. well, well, look at like, you know, look at, look at like, you know, that. who is, who is Miles' big adversary that he'd fight with all the time? Tio. <laughs> you know what I mean by you know I hate that motherfucker. Well, you know, but meanwhile, To was like the man. You know what I mean by he he yeah. he shepherded Miles through so much in so many different ways. You know, right, right, yeah, yeah. I think, so, and the so, thing is, it takes a team to create that kind of art, right? You, it's hard. You can't do it by yourself. You need you need to surround yourself you're, you're, with the best people. Exactly. But you know what? Also, I found out. I also found there were several situations. You know, sometimes you know, so, sometimes it's, it's better not to get what you wish for, because yeah. when you meet some people, sometimes. And you hold them in such a high position, and then you find out how they really are. Right. Sometimes yeah, it's like, yeah. oh my god, yeah, I can't yeah. believe this. Especially if it's your, I, hero, I, it's your hero. Yeah, well, what's a hero? A couple yeah. of heroes I work with. I'm saying to myself, oh my god, yeah, I, I can't didn't believe. Know. You know what? I, I I had no idea. And you go through it and everything, and then, but you see the genius and you appreciate it. But then you say, oh, he's just not a good guy. You yeah. know what I mean? I think in that situation and, and, too, you focus on the genius part, and then you just don't just don't go hang out with them. <laughs> well, I mean, I depends know. on how they're treating you when, no, you, when you're working with them. You yeah, know exactly. I mean? Yeah, you know, you might say, "Well, I'll do this for this asshole," but you know, 
Like, how much we'll are you getting paid? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm bumping up my cartage bill for, for this aggravation. Exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> Double but, scale. You know, it, yeah, exactly. You know, but <laughs> I don't know, man. You know, I'm, I'm looking and I keep on saying there's just some things that are so important, man. Your health is so important. You know, right. I had anxiety problems. All well, through those years, I was having deep anxiety issues because there was so much pressure. Yeah. You know, even though you know, even though you don't realize it until you until something goes down and you realize, oh yeah, there's a lot of pressure happening. Yeah, they're right giving now. you a million dollars to get a hit off off a of Luther, like it, that's for real. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. With yeah. I'm staying at the Sunset Marquee for three months with my own rental car per diem every day and a crazy salary. Right. They don't want to with Jason. He's playing video games in the lounge. You know what I mean? Exactly. And the other part of it is you better deliver, right? Like you can have all that oh. stuff, but you better deliver. I was never worried about that. But yeah. You know, man, when you're at this place, you're not worried about that. You, you, yeah. you know when you don't deliver? When you put in the wrong scenario. Right. right. That's when you don't deliver. You know what I mean? But like if you're like a rock guitar player and you're playing on a country date, you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's like, you know. It's going to be challenging. <laughs> exactly. You yeah. know what I mean? You, yeah, you know, I you kind of see what you kind of see what's going on. But most people that ever called me knew exactly what they wanted. Right. And, you know, and the ones that didn't, I helped them get to that place. Awesome. Hey, Jason. Um, Thank yeah. you so much for joining me. Um, My pleasure, and I, man. And, and I'd love to do this again. Like I said, I know you've got sure. other lots of projects coming up. Um, cool. and, and hopefully once all this COVID stuff dies away or goes away or whatever, then and we get on the road. Um, I'm really looking forward to hopefully I'll get a chance to, to see you in person and hear you live. Where, where are you based out of? I'm based out of Las Vegas. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, I, you know, my, I just spoke to my friend who lived in Las Vegas the other night, Tommy Schumann. You know, Tommy. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. He lives in Las Vegas. You know, it's a small little world here, <laughs> like New York. Well, it is. Thing, but you know? I wouldn't live in. I don't think I could live in Vegas, though. It's yeah. A, yeah. I kind of. I came here. Over. I came here back in the late '80s because there was so much work oh. just for for what yeah. I was doing for the live stuff. Um, okay. Yeah, but it's fine, and I and I, I get to New York a lot, and I love going to the village. I, just the whole thing. It's the vibe. Is you don't want to come to New York, right? New York may never be the same. I know. Yeah, I know. It's tough. I mean, we'll see what happens, but it is. It, yeah. It's tough, and you know, uh, ain't getting any younger. And I just want to get the most out of this life while I'm right. here. Me and my wife were together 51 years, you know, we're awesome. trying just to get the most out of all of this. Yeah. But um, you know what I'm going to do? I have a, I did my one man show for this uh, um, experience muse, it was called. And I did it from a club in, uh, um, in uh, Tarrytown called the Jazz Forum. And I have oh, okay. the link to that and everything. And I'd like to send it to you so you can check it out and see what's I love going this. on. Yeah, for me. sure. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to send it to you. It, okay. I'm, I'm going to send you, send you a, a, a link for Rebecca Angel as well. Awesome. Yeah. And what we're going to do, Jason, is in this podcast episode, people can check out all your links. We're going to include all that. Or, uh, Nigel oh, does, that's uh, great. All that for me in France. And Nigel's, and, Nigel's just a, a treasure, man. I love yeah, Nigel. He's, he's a, a great sweetheart. Guy. And uh, he's my co-producer on the series. So Okay, um, great. Yeah, so we'll make sure everybody can find you. And if people want to reach out to you, like you said, they're welcome to email you. There, there's You're on all the social media outlets. Um and I, I want to thank you so much because I know you're sure. a busy guy. And, and even though we're dealing I'm not with that busy, who's well, busy I know, right now? The, the, I, know, but, busy. But I know, appreciate, you know, I appreciate it, your time. <laughs> do, you, do you know who Harvey P. Carr was? I know the name. Yeah, I don't know. American Beauty, American Splendor. Right, right. He, yeah. he wrote it. Anyway, he's on the Letterman show one day and they're going to him. They're going to him. Well, you know, I mean, you're, you know, I'm sure the things are going so great for you. And I mean, all these people are trying to get a hold of you and everything. And he goes, what? What people? Who? <laughs> Who's going to get a hold of me? <laughs> exactly. you know? And I keep on I saying, know, you know, well, know. you're so, well, you know, well, you're so busy and everything like that. Really? Uh, who's busy? I'm <laughs> you not, should, you know. You should tell my bank account. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, I know, I know, exactly. Well, that's a whole other story, man. Yeah, you know? I know. I hey, know. man. Thank you so much. I had a really nice time. You're a good cat to work with at any time, and I will just stay in touch. And I will get. Absolutely. But please tell me when it's ready so I can go and spread it around. And I will do also. that. I'll, I'll, I'll we'll tag you, and we'll get make sure that people know about it. Um, this is going to go out on all the podcast outlets, and we also have our music pages. The music pages have seven million followers. That's all music related, so it's That's definitely uh, you'll, you'll probably be getting some emails. <laughs> So, so I shouldn't grab, I, well, you know, we'll see what happens. So I, I'll, yeah. I'll just delay buying the Porsche. That's it's, all, yeah. Know. You might want to hold off for a month, maybe. <laughs> that's a Porsche. Yeah, right. Exactly. Thank you very much. You know, well, it's, well, <laughs> well, 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 it's, well, it's, it's almost like when we were doing Luther and stop to love. Yeah. And the song was a smash and Nat Adderley Jr. co-wrote it with him. He goes to the bank and brings them Billboard magazine and says, here's my song. It's number one. We want to buy a house. Yeah. The banker says to him, well, when the money from the song comes in, yeah, come back exactly. and tell yeah, me exactly. and we'll deal with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> when you get your two points from the album, you come back. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Which may never exist because we'll always find a way to have to recoup. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you All so right, much. Man. Thank you so much. My Jason. pleasure, man. It. Thank you so much. Have a awesome. nice day, man. You Take too. care.
awesome talking with you.